everyone in? I'm here. Hi, JP. Are you excited for this? Super excited. Awesome, man. You're going to do great. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining. Logging in here from Big Sky, Montana. It's nice seeing uh, people on these Zooms that have entered for the event to listen to us live. Uh, we'll also have a lot of this um, for repurposed content, uh, so you can follow up with us after. But I have a really super exciting guest with me today, uh, John Paul Martin of Upterra. And we're going to talk about water is life. We're going to learn about structured water and how it creates healthier produce and plant medicines and long form description of that, uh, a nice little quote that we um, came up with here um, to add in by Dr. Masuru Amuto. Water is the mirror that has the ability to show us what we cannot see. It is the blueprint of a reality, which can change with a single positive thought. All it takes is faith if you're open to it. My name is Brian Chaplin and I am the founder of Medicine Box, uh, where our mission is to co-create human health and happiness while harmonizing a relationship with Mother Earth. And Mother Earth is very, very potent in my life personally, as well as professionally. And John and I met uh, New Year's Eve around, there's a little backstory here because it's really awesome, uh, around a um, prayer circle and setting intentions for New Year's and uh, there was some plant medicine involved and uh, he was across the room and I heard him mention something about consciousness of water and structured water and I just went bing I'm going to talk to that guy and we ended up talking for about four hours after that so this essentially is the cliff note version of that conversation and up Tara uh, a little bit about them uh, bridging the gap between the technological and the ecological. Uptera offers a 360 degree farm wellness program, including water structuring technology that stimulates the processes which occur naturally as part of the water cycle. Returning irrigation water to its natural state, thereby reducing water and input needs by 30% or more with nothing to replace and nothing to wear out. Upterra's journey is just as much about technology and positive environmental stewardship as it is about its social impact. And I did describe the box's core mission, and it really just kind of fits right into that. And that's that co-creating piece, I'm not doing that alone. And uh, our guest today, John Paul Martin, is a co-founder and chief operating officer at Upterra. Uh, he lives at the intersection of ecology and technology, physics and metaphysics, science and spirituality, bridging the gap to accelerate the integration of our beliefs and the resulting quantum leap in human understanding and quality of life for all, capital letters, A-L-L. -L. John Paul's career began in software engineering at such firms as Booz Allen Hamilton, Advantage Solutions, and SpaceX prior to founding his first startup, GrowX, a vertical farming hardware software company focused on the cannabis industry in 2015. John Paul is now fully focused on the world's water resources. Big, big task, ensuring its purity and supply remains available for generations to come. So as you can see, everybody, we have a super, super fun episode ahead of us here. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce our guest today, Mr. John Paul Martin. Thank you for that introduction, Brian. Very much appreciated. Very happy to be here. Hello, everyone. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your openness to potentially new things. Where are you logging in today, John? I am here at Upterra headquarters in San Rafael, California. It's a beautiful sunny day down here. Right on. Yeah. Where are Logging you in from Big Sky, Montana, but I do live at uh, Lake Tahoe, California. And so uh, this also is a very exciting conversation because water is such a huge part of my life. Um, I've been in Tahoe for coming up on 19 years and 
that lake, you know, 72 miles around, 22 miles long, 12 miles wide, 1600 feet deep, uh, has so much consciousness to it. And it has helped me uh, have a lot of fun. Um, it has kept me sane. It has brought a lot of serenity into my life and healing. And, um, I don't know what I'd do without it. And I think, um, when I first heard you talking about uh, consciousness and water and, and the work that you're doing, bridging that, you know, technological and uh, ecological gap, it was just such a fascinating um, conversation uh, to be had and to be further explored. Part of my uh, evolution at, in the cannabis industry and in the hemp industry, I was a former uh, traditional uh, market farmer and, you know, we used a lot of water when we grew cannabis, you know, and it's almost embarrassing uh, to say how much water we did uh, use lot. to <laughs> yield. Uh, you know, it was always going for yield and, you know, to grow a 10, 12 pound plant in Nevada County, California, you know, in September, you know, when it's super hot out and you're just, you know, water, swell, water, swell, uh, three, 4,000 gallons a day sometimes. And, you know, through that process, it was always about how can we reduce the amount of water that we're using, you know, and be better stewards of the environment, you know, catch water, you know, using permaculture techniques. Um, and, you know, that was just uh, kind of the, the journey that I went through. So I know Uptair is doing a lot of work uh, with the reduction of water in mine, but also being able to increase yields. And that's definitely something I want to learn more about. And I know the people that are uh, listening uh, are definitely going to want to learn more about that too. So let's talk about, yeah, let's talk about how your Uptair is reducing uh, water, you know, consumption um, in agriculture, but also how it's increasing yields and, and making you know, healthier plants for everybody. Absolutely. So I guess we'll just jump right into to structured water then um, and just give people really a, a basis for the scientific component of what's happening here and then how our devices are eliciting that structured effect and how that effect is working with the biology of plants. Does that sound good? Absolutely. Beautiful. Um, maybe we get the, the structured water slide put up. That would be sweet. So people have a little bit of a reference. Um, so for those of you that are not familiar with uh, structured water, um, oh, is that the only one we have? Oh, that's the only one we have. Let's not use that one. Um, I can use chat. Uh, I thought I'd send you guys another one on structured water. That's okay. So, you know, we're taught in, well, maybe high school biology, maybe younger now, um, you know, water is this molecule, right? H2O. Um, Water, when you think about it in nature, water is not just H2O. In any given natural environment, water is filled with all kinds of things, right? It's filled with minerals, it's filled with bacteria, fungi, detritus, other types of um, biological organic matter that's in various states of decomposition. The water is really this, this concoction, this solution of all these different things in different states. Right. And even our drinking water, we know, I mean, for you, Brian, being in Tahoe, I think, uh, I think you mentioned y'all have access to some of the cleanest drinking water in the country. Kudos to you for that. Um, but in most municipal yeah. systems, all kinds of things are being added to the water to make it quote unquote safe for drinking. Um, and I think it's less about the safety of the consumer in terms of just it being able to drink. It's more about ensuring the safety of that water over the course of its, um, and over the course of it getting from wherever it's being stored, which is generally surface water, or it's being stored in a reservoir, most likely, depending on where you live, um, and then going through all kinds of infrastructure and pipes that are, God only knows how old, based on where you are in the country or what they're made of, as we saw in Flint, Michigan, which is not an isolated problem. In California, you can actually go online to the water board map and see all the places in the state where they still have lead in the infrastructure um, before it finally gets to uh, your mouth or in the case of crops, the crops. So 
what is structured water? You brought up Dr. Emoto's work. So for any of you who aren't familiar with Dr. Emoto's work, it's an amazing Japanese gentleman that's done all kinds of experiments showing how consciousness affects water. How taking two glasses of water and doing something as simple as writing the words love on one and the words hate on another and then freezing them to view the effect of the structure, the underlying crystalline matrix of those molecules once they freeze, how that changes. And so what we're finding is that in a natural state, when water is at its optimum, you know, we all talk about drinking, like the best water we think of to drink of is usually spring water, right? Like, oh, okay, I want this water that's coming straight out of a mountain spring. It's gonna be cold, it's coming straight out of the ground, so it's clean, it's full of all these elements, it's probably the right pH, great. Now that water then is now on the surface where it's getting exposed to all kinds of biology. It's also getting exposed to sunlight. And water actually oxidizes. And you know, modern chemistry doesn't really address that particular fact that water can oxidize. Water doesn't like being hot, doesn't like being in the sun. And so you have all this water that's on the surface, it's gonna go into its natural processes of going through streams and rivers and larger and larger water courses. And then maybe it's making onto a holding pond on your farm. Or in the case of a lot of other farms, maybe it's coming out of the ground uh, from an aquifer. In either case, the water is actually not at its optimum energetic potential. You're taking it from a part of its life cycle where it's already had some of its energy potential removed from it. And so you're not getting optimum hydration. So what we're doing here at Optera is utilizing principles of biomimicry. So looking at nature, looking at the really the geometry of nature, understanding how energy likes to move in certain geometries. And if you utilize those principles in mechanical designs and you align the flow of things in your mechanics the same way that nature does, you can have much more efficient technology because you're actually, quote unquote, going with the flow as opposed to really creating friction. And we're talking here, we're talking really at the quantum level. So our devices use various types of geometry to structure water. What does that actually mean? So science has been able to show that the bond angle between the hydrogen and oxygen bonds change. Water is a polar molecule. What does that mean? It's basically a little magnet. There's one side that has a negative charge. There's one side that has a positive charge. When you change the bond angle, you are affecting the charge differential of that dipole, which is then affecting how that particular magnet molecule links up with all those other little magnet molecules. And we're not talking about just the water, right? Any other dissolved, uh, whether it's a mineral or any biology, everything has charge. Everything is essentially a battery. It's the fundamental level of our understanding of the material realm. Everything is electricity and magnetism. All forces can be reduced to electricity and magnetism and how those two are interacting. And so what we can do is utilize the principles of nature to recharge water such that that water becomes immediately more hydrating is effectively what, what we're talking about, right? So now with the same volume of water, whether that's water is being drank by a plant or by a human, it's working its magic in your biology more efficiently. So you need less of it. Or if you are, again, a, a grower that's trying to really push yield, if you're giving an equivalent amount of water to your crops, you're going to get more yield because that charge potential is being utilized more effectively by your crop. So mind I don't know how that... literally blown. <laughs> mind blown. Um, I, I love how you are using the word hydration, you know, um, when I was farming cannabis, you know, we always used to use the mantra, feed the soil, not the plant. And many other farmers usually just feed the plant to get that, you know, uh, exceptional yield. But over time, the soil depletes and nutrients. And you're talking about hydrating and the fact of hydrating the soil. So the water that you're using is more bioavailable for the mycorrhizal and the fungi and all the bacteria that live in that beautiful, you know, four to six inches of, of topsoil that we call the rhizosphere. Um, now, speak, 
speaking a little bit more towards how, like using nature uh, for, you know, you're blending this like ecological, uh, ecological technology of nature with modern day technology. And my mind's going to one of the principles of permaculture that I love so much, uh, work with nature, not against it. So I'm hearing you're blending a little bit of like tech, ecology, permaculture, traditional ag, you know, organic farming. Uh, there's a lot going on here, JP. And um, extremely fascinating. Thank Working you, with man. nature, not against it. Yes. Yeah. And there's probably so, so much to talk about here. It's like what direction to go in. Um, but, you know, the consciousness of water too, you know, living in, in Tahoe, you know, there's, I live, I, I have, I'm blessed. I have a beautiful home, you know, right cell facing. I get the, the sunrise, the sunset, but it never gets old staring at the lake and that water. And I always use this mantra on myself, you know, is if a tree falls in the woods, you know, consciousness, if a tree falls in the woods and no one's around, does it make a sound? Or if there's reflections on the surface of Tahoe and there's just a little bit of, you know, movement on that surface layer and that bright blue sun is hitting it and there's reflections coming off going back to the sky is that actually happening if I'm not looking at it, right? If I take my head away from it, I don't know if it's happening. Profound but question. as a conscious observer, <laughs> you know, you're talking about, right? You're talking, you're talking about on the quantum level. So I wanted to bring in some like quantum, <laughs> quantum thoughts here. Um, and, you know, I have a, a great friend, Tyler, you know, Tyler. And uh, we go down, you know, over the summer we had, you know, our Thursday dates down at the, you know, sunrise at, at the, at the lake. And we just watch the surface of the water as the sun's rising and hitting it and it's moving and it's talking and there is consciousness in it. And, um, even my dog, my Husky, who's usually running all around crazy, she just would just stand and wade in the water and look at the surface of the water and looking at my dog being like, what are you doing for water? I think everyone wants to hear about that. And um, let's talk about that. Let's just jump in and see where it goes. All right, we're going, we're going deep. We're going deep. We're going to the bottom of the lake. <laughs> it, I want, let's go to the bottom of the lake. And then I want to share, when we first met, I shared with you uh, what I call the spawn, my spawn of consciousness as a dream that I had. Um, and it was a reoccurring dream, but I want to talk about it after we talk about, uh, your take on, uh, consciousness of water. Beautiful. Um, well, I think it's important to realize, at least from my perspective and my belief system that everything is conscious. <laughs> and I think what, what you're talking about here at the quantum level and that question about whether you know if a tree if a tree falls in the woods you hear it right in the science realm there's something called the observer observer effect are you familiar with that brian i am yes so i think something the conscious really, observer really important a, a path way does not come into existence the observer effect so there's this famous experiment called the gold slit experiment in particle physics and i'm not a particle physicist so i'm gonna do my best here to give you a summary but essentially they found that if there was an observer in the room when they were doing this experiment whether that was a human or even a camera the effect or the quantum effect they observed in this experiment changed so this is the whole idea that light can be both a particle or a wave depending on whether there's an observer or not. Essentially, if there's an observer, light behaves like a particle, like a physical thing. And if there's no observer in the room, then it behaves like a wave, like uh, your Wi-Fi signal or like radio waves, or sound waves. Um, and so that's very interesting. 
right? This idea that something observing our reality can have an effect on the material realm. Um, and what we're seeing in Dr. Emoto's work, Dr. Joe Pollack at the University of Washington, I mean, the, the list goes on. There's a gentleman, um, Marcel Vogel. Most of you are familiar with the thing that you're staring at right now are the things on these phones, an LCD screen, liquid crystal display, was invented by a guy named Marcel Vogel, who was a researcher at IBM back in, I don't know, the 60s or 70s. He was doing all kinds of experiments with crystals and water and showing how conscious thought and the human biofield, humans are a bio battery essentially, right? could actually imprint information signatures into water. And so that's also some of the work that we're doing here, but um, I'll take it back to the consciousness aspect. So there's another brilliant crystallographer in Australia named Veda Austin. And she's got a beautiful video on her website if you wanna take a look at it. She's definitely uh, an artist, but she shows you how water can literally pick up the holographic imprint of anything that you put next to it. So she's got Petri dishes that she'll put on top of the photograph and then freeze them. And you will literally see the reflection or the outline of whatever was in the photo frozen into the water, which is just fascinating <laughs> to me, right? Like, the mechanism of how this is working is by no means even close to beginning to be understood. Um, as I look at the work that we're doing here at Aptera, we're, we are also imprinting information at the quantum level into the water to help crops grow. I say that we're like, the guys or gals back in the day that were inventing the first black and white camera in terms of our level of fidelity in terms of how to do this, right? Like eventually we're gonna be at you know 8K, but right now we have this very low fidelity understanding. We're just starting to build on the, really the massive amounts of research that have been done for hundreds of years, actually going back even thousands of years if you really get into it. We've got an awesome timeline on our, um, on our site that we can maybe share after this call to everyone that was on. That's kind of the history and timeline of structured water and all the research that's gone in to um, understanding this thing that you know modern, the mainstream scientific community still addresses as this, this lifeless thing. And yet as humans and as um, beings experiencing our reality, we have this colloquialism. We say water is life. Well, okay, let's really break that down and think about what we're saying. Water is life, right? So maybe all these things that we see around water, this is one way I like to think about it, is really like the skeleton or the structure that allows water, which is life to become animal. And I think we are, again, just at the beginnings of understanding what water is, how, what our innate relationship is to it, right? Our bodies are what? Our bodies are 70% water, right? And actually the percentage of our body, the human body that is water is equivalent to the percentage of water on the earth's body. Fascinating the salinity of our blood is nearly identical to the salinity of the ocean. Also fascinating. Is that just a coincidence? No, no, it's not. The universe is holographic. All the information that we're seeing is represented at all dimensions or levels of our reality. When we're talking about different ways of looking at things, whether it's chemistry or biology or physics or metaphysics or art, we're literally just using different frameworks to observe our reality but at the end of the day it's all the same thing so the more we can do to unite those perspectives the more we can do to integrate all these different ways of looking at that into one coherent framework of understanding of our experience the faster we can get to really building the society that uh i at least envision we can have one of us thriving um a thriving, healthy globe that is supporting all life, not just human life, right? And is 
regenerative and sustainable for eons to come. So that was a lot. <laughs> we went we went to the depths on that one, JP, but I have a feeling there's uh, a lot deeper expansiveness we can go to. And uh, as you were talking uh, about, you know, water is life and we're 70% water and, you know, we, our consciousness is, you know, in the womb and our mother and we're, we're in water for nine months and then we come out and, um, you know, why stop, why stop there, you know? And, uh, I, I had this reoccurring dream, um, for all my life until I was about 22 years old when I moved out to Tahoe and it was me, a childhood friend, you know, roaming the forest and, you know, looking for a, uh, a new swimming hole or a place to build a new fort. Uh, this is a pre internet, you know, I, I was, I grew up in the eighties and nineties and Both the days. Uh, that's how I, <laughs> That's how I spent my childhood was like out in the woods and out in nature. And, you know, I'm extremely grateful for it, you know, so I can have conversations like this now and be like, that's what attracted me to that in the first place. And this reoccurring dream, I'd find this cliffside with these like beautiful, you know, granite slabs and, you know, canopy of trees and, you know, turquoise and blue and green water. And, um, it was so real that when I'd wake up, I'd be like, where is this place? Like I could never, ever, ever find it in, you know, my waking life, but really is waking life and sleeping life any different? I mean, it's just consciousness and observable reality and eyes shut, whatever it is. And as I started to evolve in my own consciousness, I started to think about this dream again. And I moved to Tahoe. About a weekend, I took my friends to a swimming hole that I had known was there on the east shore of Tahoe. And I still do this today, but I walked over the guardrail. This is outside of Incline Village and dove off the granite slab, granite slab. I grew up in the granite state of New Hampshire. And my parents had met in Tahoe in 1976, moved back to New Hampshire in 1978. And I was born about less than a, uh, it was about a year, year later, born in 80, January 6, 1980. And so I grew up hearing of Tahoe and this magical land and all the enchanted forests and the mountains and the lake and the clarity of the lake. And when I dove in, it was my second time in Tahoe, and I dove all the way to the bottom, about 20 feet, and I flipped myself around on my back and looked up through the water i'm in lake tahoe's womb right looking up at the surface of the water with the sun beaming through and i just went it shocked me it brought me right back to my dream that was the place that i had been searching for all my life in that dream and i haven't right. had the dream since because i'm living the dream right that's so right. when that's the consciousness of water right there and when we started to talk about that at new year's i was like I got to tell JP about my dream. Like people might think I'm crazy talking about that, but I don't think so. So Tahoe is like such a magical place. It was the place that I had been searching for since I was in my mother's womb, because that's where my spawn of conscience or August knock on wood. I think they're going to make it. Um, but you know, this is just such fascinating stuff for me to be able to talk about now. So thank you all for listening to Brian's spawn of consciousness dream. Thank, you, uh, thank you, JP for like bringing that in to, you know, set up a, a foundation for that to actually, you know, make a little bit of sense. So, um, and anything you could, you know, talk about, towards that or is that uh you know add any like garnish to that or just let it let it ride and then mm. we can get into some of the more less fascinating less uh fun stuff about complications of water and dead water and the overuse of water and bottled water and all the other things that uh so surround water 
so, so many things. So many things, right? You start to look at all the things that water touches in our yeah. in our daily lives, but also just in our in the industrial systems that provide all the all the things that that lead to our material abundance in this life. Um, but in terms of adding anything to what you just said, I mean, I guess I'll, I'll share that there's been a number of experiments being done now uh, in quantum physics um, and a bunch of new models mathematically that are really starting to prove this idea that like time doesn't actually exist, right? We experience linear time, but actually all potential, all possibilities, all timelines exist simultaneously. And so you as a child having this recurring dream and then having this experience, quote unquote, years later from a linear perspective, right? Obviously the whole time that you were having this dream, this place that you were seeing also existed. So were you just seeing the place? Were you using one of the senses that again, the Western scientific community still doesn't even acknowledge exist? which is the idea of clairvoyance, um, one of the many undeveloped or atrophied muscles that each human body and its infinitely uh, uh, complex technology um, we have available to? Um, or were you actually using a different sense, which is premonition, also another mostly atrophied uh, muscle that most people have not, one, either don't even acknowledge that they have, or maybe have these experiences and then chalk them up to coincidence or whatever other uh, thing fits into the nice understanding and belief systems they have in the world. Um, or were you, again, you're seeing, you're already seeing your future. You were seeing that timeline. You were seeing that moment and experiencing that. Um, and the question is, like, I'm sure you've seen the movie, The Matrix, Brian. Oh yeah. Okay, so. My, one of my goals in life is to Become like Neo, and when all life's complications are coming at me, I can just do this like he does to uh, Agent Smith at the end of Matrix One. Yes, I'm with you on that goal, my friend. That's definitely the path that I'm on as well. Um, and I mean, we could go down all of the messages that are encoded in that movie, um, that would be its own episode. But my favorite one is the one where he's, uh, not my favorite, but like the most poignant to what we're talking about right now is that moment when he's talking to the Oracle, right? And he walks in there and you know she's baking the cookies and she turns around and she's like, oh, and don't worry about the vase, right? He turns around, knocks over the vase. And he's like, what vase? Knocks it over. And then she's like, you know, what's really gonna, you know, whatever her little colloquialism was, is like, would you still have knocked it over if I hadn't told you? Right. <laughs> and that's where we get into this idea of like, okay, like what is cause and effect? Quantum physicists are finding that the idea of cause and effect breaks down at the quantum level. Again, if there's no time at the quantum level, if all potentials exist simultaneously, then an action in any given moment actually affects the whole system instantaneously all at once. So from a linear time perspective, an action now is affecting the past and it's affecting the future. And so that's its own kind of like thing to kind of wrap your head around, but they're literally doing experiments that are proving this. Um, and you know, if you start to dive into the uh, indigenous wisdom traditions or the Eastern mystic traditions or even the occult Western traditions like the Kabbalah, all of these traditions describe these ideas in their own way. And really they're all again, holographic manifestations of the same truth as experienced by the individuals that codified their understanding of their experience of it. And where we're at now in terms of our collective evolution of consciousness, is where all of these systems are beginning to merge. The East and the West are colliding, science and spirituality. Science is finally caught up, finally has the tools and the level of understanding to be able to test some of these quote unquote spiritual ideas or metaphysical ideas, right? It's like, well, okay, when 
science can now prove this spiritual idea. Right? Oh, okay. Well, maybe all these other ideas that we consider quote unquote spiritual that we may not have the technology or the mental capacity or the math to observe yet from a scientific perspective, like maybe there's some validity and some weight to this. And we're just on the cusp of this. I mean, I am so <laughs> beyond full with joy and excitement for life and being alive in this moment at this time of transition and transformation for humanity and really the globe. And really when you start to understand the fundamental uh, an intrinsic connection amongst all things. Literally, what's happening here is affecting all there is, and vice versa, simultaneously and instantaneously. So that's its own, you know, <laughs> thing to wrap your mind around. But it's amazing. I mean, I could not be more excited about this moment right here, and to be uh, right. gifted the opportunity to be a part of it in the way that I am. This exact moment is is beautiful like you said and i'm gonna go with you on that one jp and not even going to begin to try to understand i don't know anything i'm just going to keep diving into the lake and i think that is going to help me understand this so much more what you know as you're talking i'm like you know jp is like a like a venn diagram like there's three circles there's spirituality there's science there's quantum physics and JP's right in the center there, like figuring all of this out for the intrinsic value, of this planet and the work you are doing is just um, in any way I can and get your message out there, get your technology out there about the amazingness of, of the work you're doing and the, the consciousness of water. And I really want to, before we do nay, um, something that, you know, I'm really passionate about in California. I think a lot of people that live in California now are becoming way more aware of the overconsumption of water in agricultural crops like, um, almonds and alfalfa, uh, the pg and dams, uh, as well as, um, you know, and cannabis and hemp and then the fire season that we have that is uh, usually from August to through October that's just becoming way more gnarly you know in California gnarly is a word that we use to describe something that is just like either tremendously amazing or tremendously just devastating and there are complications of water in, in California and I think one of the uh you know, other mind blowing things that you told me was um, when we plug in our phone, right, in California or anywhere, really, but specifically in California, when we plug in our phone, we're not actually pulling electricity or using electricity or even wasting electricity when it's charging at night. We're evaporating water. Let's talk about that real quick before we go to QA, because I know there's a lot of patient people that probably have some amazing questions for you, but evaporating water because of all the dams in California and the dead water that uh, is happening. So the complications of water and then kind of tying that dead water into versus, you know, living spring water. And then uh, we'll open it up for, you know, 10, 15 minutes of questions. Okay. And three minutes or less. <laughs> all right. Ready, so on on the electrical point so obviously not exclusively and i don't know what the exact percentage is in terms of what percentage of california's total power comes from hydroelectric all y'all can put that into DuckDuckGo and search for it if you want the number on that but pg e right pacific gas and electric that controls at least the power and gas for northern california i know southern california has a little bit more diversity going on in its electrical infrastructure there's socal edison and uh san diego gas and electric and maybe one or two other ones anyhow pg neo has over 100 hydroelectric dams spread throughout the mountains of the sierra nevadas in northern california and so when you think about you know again people talk about flow right and like going with the flow and staying in the flow well, when we, are when we are building dams, we are literally 
blocking the flow, or stopping it. If water is life, and that flow of the water is integral to the life and health of all of the land that is adjacent to all of those water courses, then by blocking that flow, we're literally starving the land of the life force that it needs. And it's not just from a physical water hydration standpoint. If you think about all of the gravitational potential and energy of all that water moving and coming down, right? So you've got streams and tributaries feeding into larger and larger water courses. You have more mass, more inertia, water moving through all of those things actually creating charge. And so anytime that river is going like this and you have all of that charge essentially slamming into a riverbank, you are sending the river is literally ejecting energy into that land. And so when we are doing these things to starve and cut off that natural flow of energy, the net effect on the entire environmental ecosystem starts to become apparent. We're seeing it everywhere, right? I mean, you look on the hills, the hills in the summers now are no longer golden, right? California is the golden state because of the dry grass. You're starting to see patches of dirt where there's no, there's not even grass growing anymore. This is compounded by what we're doing in Central Valley, where you have farmers continuing to pull water out of an aquifer without letting it recharge every year, such that we've seen up to 10 feet of subsidence, the land elevation literally dropping 10 feet over the last few decades as a result of so much groundwater being pulled out of the ground without being recharged. In addition, we've got all of the water going to the Southern California Water Project and the aqueduct that goes from the Sacramento River going all the way down um, to LA, being pumped over those mountains to get to LA to feed um, you know, the millions of people that live down there, their drinking water. Um, and you know, I think it's a really important point to know that it's not the consumers that are the cause of the problem. And yes, we have a lot of people consuming a lot of water in this state, but in terms of relative percentage versus agriculture, like it's a drop in, in the literal and, figurative buckets, right? We're doing things like growing almonds in this state, right? So California grows 95% of the world's supply of almonds. We've got over a million acres of almonds planted and each acre of almonds requires about 1.2 million gallons of water per year. And that stat about it taking one gallon to produce one almond is true. 100% true based on the trials that we have done with almond growers in the Central Valley. So when we start to think about our economy and managing our water resources, you're like, oh, you know, there's this whole thing about the Central Valley farmers and they need water to grow food and this and that. I'm like, okay, yes. And what are all the things that we're growing purely for indulgence or cash, quote unquote cash crops? Right. And our, the question that I, I pose to those that are that are operating these businesses and that are posing to the managers of our resources is, you know, is it valuable to California to be growing this insanely well, one of the most water intensive crops there that there is to supply 95 percent of the whole world with this crop? That's really a specialty crop, very high priced good that as far as I know is not part of anyone's core diet. It's not keeping anyone from starving as far as I know. I could be totally wrong. I would love to know if there is some part of the world where like, you know, if they didn't have almonds, they'd be starving to death. But that's just one example of what's happening in California's agricultural sector where we really need to start asking our questions like, what are we doing with our water? There's one more thing that I wanna um, just touch on real quick and then we gotta get into Q and A. Um, but you know, it's happening in the Eastern deserts of San Diego where they're taking Colorado River water, which is also highly impacted. You have all of these different um, rights onto it, such that it's barely a trickle by the time it gets to California, but they're diverting that into the deserts of Eastern San Diego to grow alfalfa. Now you're like, okay, alfalfa, like we need that for our dairy cows, right? Well. The thing is that that alfalfa, that water that we're being used actually isn't being used for anything in the US. What's happening is that alfalfa that's being grown in the deserts of Eastern San Diego is actually being put, put onto container ships and shipped to China for China's cows so that their burgeoning middle class, which has a growing demand for milk production can have milk. And why is that happening? Well, it comes down to economics. So it's actually cheaper because of the trade deficit because these ships that are going back to China from the US are literally empty. 
it's cheaper to ship alfalfa from the eastern desert of San Diego County to China than it is from the eastern deserts of San Diego County to Northern California. And that's just like mind blowing to me. When I heard that, I was like, whoa, we really need to figure out what we're doing with our water, what our priorities are, and really thinking about the long-term health of not just the state, but literally the whole system. Um, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you, JP. I mean, this is, again, such a fascinating conversation. And um, it's like we're just shipping our beloved water out of California uh, to support um, dairy meat production that what gets sent back to the United States. It's very interesting how the economics work there. But um, I do have an amazing question here from our friend, Carolyn. Um, yeah. Hi, Carolyn. Thank you for coming. Thanks for joining. Uh, Carolyn is Hi. curious to hear about the difference in water consumption uh, for milk production from cows versus almonds. Very super good question. It was you said one gallon of water to produce one little tiny almond. Milk production, right? Milk consumption is going down, but here's the caveat. It's going down, but milk alternatives like almond milk is going up. And then also you could probably tie in like soybeans, rice, oats. I've, I've changed my almond drinking, almond milk drinking habit to oat milk. Uh, I don't know if that has any effect if I'm saving water or not. Caroline, so milk production, I, I love yeah. you. <laughs> Thank you for the question. And I definitely don't have all the answers. Um, I have been a part of this conversation with a lot of friends that I know. A lot of people that are like hardcore vegan activists. I love them for the role that they have in the transition that we're in. I don't believe that there is a definitive answer. Um, and I don't pretend to have all of the answers. Um, from a health standpoint, I would say that the only thing you need to be drinking is structured water. <laughs> Whether that's coming from a mountain spring or from an Uptera device or from any one of the other companies that are doing structured water. Um, the only thing that our bodies really are designed to be optimized to consume from a liquid perspective is healthy water. So we could just stop drinking all the milks and solve a lot of our water problems <laughs> just with that. <laughs> that may not be what everyone wants to hear, but I think that with where we're at from my perspective, again, this is completely my opinion, but from where we're at in terms of our global constraints and agricultural land production, in terms of our population and just literally the water requirements for our drinking water in terms of what we need to survive. If we continue on the track that we're on, life is going to start getting much harder for people. And it's already hard for probably most people in the world. We are sitting here with an immense level of privilege and access to even be having this discussion in space, to be having the time to even have this conversation and not be worrying about where our water is coming from. We're not like the women in Africa that walk six miles a day to go to a dirty pond to find, to bring water back for their families, right? And the reality is the whole system of the earth is connected. So whatever we're doing here is literally impacting the whole system as well. So we're starting to look at how rainfall is changing over the course of the earth, how the, um, these, all the deforestation in, uh, in uh, the Amazon is affecting weather in the Sierra Nevadas. And like the reality is that we need to start thinking about the earth as one thing. There is one water resource that is the whole earth. And unless we start managing our resources from that systemic perspective, if we start, if we keep thinking about this as like, oh, this is mine, or that's yours, or, you know, we keep imagining the world as having these imaginary country lines on it, which again, are these things that we put into our consciousness that don't actually exist, right? Until we start to do that, we're going to continue going in this direction that's going to make life a lot harder. And it's going to start having an impact on those with privilege. I think that that's really why we're sitting here having this conversation. It's like, oh, we've been so fortunate for so long. 
and of all this abundance. And now we're like, oh, we start to have enough awareness, enough technology and monitoring systems to look at the impact of what we're doing. We're like, oh, this probably isn't good. And it's probably time to start thinking in a different way. Um, and this is not to shame anyone for their water consumption. It's not to shame anyone for their, um, you know, what they choose to put in their bodies. It's absolutely the last thing that I want to do. It's just that we all need to start thinking about how the systems that we're supporting with everyday choices are having these, you know, the butterfly effect on the rest of our ecosystem, on the rest of this spaceship that is our plan. Great answer, JP. And I have another one here from Michael. Thank you, Michael, for joining in. Uh, hi, from a health perspective, how can we properly take into the account the radioactive compounds they're finding on the shores? I assume that's shorelines of the ocean. Not sure what types of water filters, if any, can protect us from radiation. As far as what's available to the public now, the answer is probably you can't. And the best advice that I can give you, Michael, is that for all of these things that are fundamentally out of your control, as much as you can do to just literally push them completely out of your consciousness to the point where they're not taking up an ounce of your mental energy thinking about them, the better off your health is going to be and the more effective you're going to be at your unique role in transitioning all of this from what it looks like in its present state to the future that we're all dreaming of, right? The best way to address the quote unquote problems of the world and you know, viewing things as problems is its own conversation that we're not going to get into today. But if, Brian, if you want to go down that rabbit hole, uh, we can do that on another show. Yeah. But the best thing that we can do, or the best advice I can give based on my experience and where I'm at in my journey is that the more we can learn to go like this and imagine all of our energy and attention, all of our mental thought processes being spent solely on that, which is ours to do. If you haven't figured that out yet, spending, I would highly encourage you to put all of your effort into figuring out what is your unique role on this planet, in this body, in this life, and just do that. That's literally all you have to do. You can tune out the rest of it because all of that is literally a distraction from you and your work in every moment. And trust that the rest will take care of itself. Hopefully that helps. Uh, Todd Marcus, thank you. Hi, curious about what your system infuses the water with to give it structure. How is that structure maintained as you deliver the water to the soil? Okay, so the infusion part is a separate part. So the structuring of the water is a magneto electro electro magneto electro hydrodynamic effect it's a big word but we're literally using geometry so we've got two different devices one has a bunch of fractally nested four-sided pyramids that causes the water's flow path to go in a very specific way to affect the charge of the water and it dissolve in it so we're not in the con within the context of the idea of structuring water, we're using geometry that we've learned from our observations of nature to change the energetic potential of the water. The imprinting side of it is the, we actually haven't even touched on, the, the Terra Scribe component, which will be in the device that we're giving away actually at the end of this show, is imprinting the water after it's been structured. So if we think of structuring water as like, for those of you that are on the younger generation may not know this term, like defragmenting your hard drive. This is the thing we had to do back in the day or reformatting a floppy disk or a memory card for your camera. Think of structuring the water as like, you know, this analogy of like blanking it. it doesn't actually do that, you know, depending on how we're thinking about it, what level of fidelity we were trying to have this conversation, but for our purposes, Think about it like that. So once it's been wiped 
or formatted, you can write to it again. So we structure the water first, and then our frequency imprinting technology is imprinting the water with subtle energy information. And so in the TerraScribe device, which I have here, I think you can see that. This is a one-inch device. These scale all the way up to 15-inch devices that we have on the farm. This portion of the device has a mineral frequency cartridge in it. It contains a proprietary blend of rare earth elements and other things that plants really like and soil really likes and biology really likes. And that information is being transferred, oh, thank you, Brian, into the water via the piezoelectric effect of the crystals that are oscillating in the device as water passes through them at a high flow rate. So what does that mean? Okay, well, back to this thing that I would assume all of you have since you're watching this. Um, every single one of these things you may not know works because it has a crystal in it. The transmitter and receiver of any wireless device has a crystal oscillator in it. And why crystals? Because crystals, when they are cut specifically, they oscillate at a very specific coherent frequency. So just like you're in your, in your radio in your car, and you're turning the knob, you're going to 99.9, .9, right? That is tuning the crystal oscillator in your car to resonate with the crystal oscillator at the transmission facility of that radio station to basically quantum entangle those two devices such that information, binary signals, MP3 files, can be transmitted from one place to another. That's essentially how this device is working except without any power. And that's something that we're really proud of is the frequency imprinting is happening without any sort of electronic device whatsoever. Now, this is version one of our device. Version two is going to be an active device that uses what's known today as, or referred to today as a scalar field or a longitudinal wave propagation or quantum entanglement. Um, but again, that's its own rapid hole that we can talk about on another show. JP, um, there's another question that can probably segue right from your flow, pun intended here, uh, from Kana Yogi. Would you recommend adding different crystals throughout the water system to charge the water before it drips onto plants? For example, shungite. Um, yes, absolutely. Now, if your intuition is guiding you, I would say follow that and test, A, B test. See what happens, see what happens when you use different materials, right? Each crystal, its innate structure and the physical material that it's made out of is going to resonate at a different fundamental frequency. So the material that a crystal is made out of is going to affect its resonance, as well as the shape of the crystal. Both of those things, the material, which is really the chemical geometry of the substance, the crystal, and then the shape of the crystal itself, which is the, you know, kind of zoomed up physical geometry of the crystal will affect how that thing vibrates in relation to all of the other energies around it. So I absolutely encourage you to do experiments, see what happens, try different crystals, try different cuts, try different placements. Um, and please do share all the beautiful things that you find. I mean, all of this is a co-creative process. And the more people that we have thinking this way and using their innate gifts to start learning and discovering all the things that we can do with this way of observing, interacting with our reality is gonna to lead to really profound, beautiful, harmonizing and healing effects at all layers of our experience. That was a great question. Thank you. And one last one here, uh, then I have a question and then we're going to finish up from uh, Deborah Allen. JP, have you provided this system for any organic cultivating facilities to date? Um, have we provided? So outside of what we're doing right now, no, so we've only been around for uh, actually not even a year yet. We're coming up on our one year anniversary in two weeks. Um, last year, we were focused on two large scale conventional farm providers or uh, producers rather that just kind of showed up for us. And we are a very small team and given the acreage that we were working with. So one farm farms like over 10,000 acres of almonds in the Central Valley. 
um, and a few other crops. The other one farms almost 8,000 acres of produce, mainly potatoes in eastern Idaho. That was our focus. But we're actually about to launch what we're calling our upreach campaign, where we're giving away 100 of these to small, organic, regenerative family farms um, or commercial farms that want to see how this device helps their farms. So these devices are not applicable to any style of farming. They're, um, so directly to answer your question, as of right now, no. All of the experiments that we do in our lab are actually done in uh, a fully regenerative soil that we make in-house. Um, but in terms of getting this into organic farmers' hands, we are just at the beginning of that process. And we're going to be doing an announcement. Hopefully, maybe we can share to this group uh, as well when that goes live. I think it's going live next week, Brian. And if any of the folks on this call would like to apply to be part of that program, we would love to have you. Um, and even if you don't necessarily qualify uh, to get a free one, we would absolutely love, and love to invite you to purchase one. Thank you, JP. And just to be uh, mindful of everyone's time, I know I could keep flowing for hours on this uh, topic. Great, great questions, everyone. Uh, I'm really grateful uh, for the people that joined and listened in as well as participating with some very thoughtful questions um, to get some very, very thoughtful answers. Um, I wanted to ask a question quick to JP is uh, real quick in less than 30 seconds. Where do you, where do you see uh, the world's water going uh, as far far as it supporting all life on Mother Earth? And how do we humans harmonize with that? 30 seconds or less, JP, you're on the spot, man. Big question, big answer. You probably don't have all the answers, but just want to hear I don't it have all the answers. nonetheless. No, I don't have all the answers. And the first answer, I would not even pretend to assume that I have any idea what's happening or what the future looks like in terms of the water supply. I'm really trying to live right here, right now, and what focus on what I can control to manifest the timeline that I want, which is one where all of our fresh water resources are truly that fresh. Mm -hmm. But any fresh water resource could be just picked up and drank without any sort of purification or processing or anything. That's the world that I want to see. Um, I actually do think, based on my understanding now, that seawater, uh, it's, if it was clean and not polluted, would be drinkable actually and highly beneficial to our bodies, but that's also a separate discussion. Um, yeah. In terms of what we can do in this moment, the best thing that you can do is put love and gratitude into everything that you're doing. If you take a look at Dr. Emoto's work, he's shown that of all of the intentions, of all the words, all the experiments they've done, the two most resilient words that they use to inform the water which even were able to withstand microwave radiation was love and gratitude. So as much as you can embody that, imprint that thought and intention into the water in your body, which you're constantly returning to the earth multiple times a day, every time you go to the bathroom, you're constantly sweating it out, you're constantly breathing it out, you're constantly informing the water in the global system. So what are we putting in the water? What is the message? What is the energy? What is the intention? that you as an individual are putting into the system? How are you informing the quantum field about what you want or what you don't want? And thinking about things you don't want actually increases the probability of those things happening. So as much as you can start to rewire your mind to only focus on what you do want, the better off you and all the rest of us will be. Just the answer I was hoping for JP <laughs> focus on the now in all good things don't have to come to an end, but we are going to continue flowing like water. Um, with the next steps here, attendees are automatically entered for a chance to win a Terra scribe as well as the full suite of medicine box products prize worth over 500 dollars. Uh, TerraScribe is a passive quantum device that uses piezoelectric effects to create resonance with the propriety mineral solution cartridge. We just heard all of about that and that some um, the process in water. 
with the mineral frequencies that are lacking within the soil, or as JP so eloquently described, hydrates the soil. And let's get back, back to uh, any contacts. I know there were some people uh, that participated, JP, that would love to follow up with you. And that's what we're all collaboration and building healthy community. Well, Mother Nature is the evolving medium that weaves it all together. Uh, there's JP's contact there. If anyone wants to uh, talk to me, learn more about Medicine Box, there is my email. I'm also on Instagram underscore Brian Chaplin. Medicine Box is on LinkedIn, all the platforms. Um, Alana uh, is behind the scenes on the Zoom, making the magic happen with all the production uh, steps. And anyone that signed up, uh, we are going to uh, follow up with a lot of uh, repurposed content, some sizzle reels, audiograms, uh, show notes, as well as a uh, mega condensed blog on all the amazingness that we spoke about today. And uh, JP, you are a beautiful, beautiful human being doing some amazing, joyful work in this world. And I am so honored to know you, call you a friend, a colleague, an associate. And I know uh, this is only the beginning of a very amazing uh, business and startup venture for you. And I, I'm going to put it right out here. The spawn of consciousness of Uptera and Medicine Box working together and exploring uh, how we can continue to collaborate and uh, build healthy communities and, and heal uh, humans in, in this earth and everyone out there that's listening, Medicine Box, myself, we create practical lifestyle solutions. You know, some of those things that we talked about today can really be condensed down into some very simple steps. When you flip on the water tap, say thank you. That's a privilege that we have. There's millions of people that do not have that privilege, right? Don't drink out of uh, plastic water bottles. Reuse bottles whenever you can get a reusable bottle. And my favorite, I have this beautiful pothos plant that is just growing all over my house with self-facing sun. When everyone asks me, what do I feed that with? I take my dog bowl from my Husky Phoenix. And when I refill it, I don't dump out that water into the sink so it goes down the drain. I dump it right back into the soil for that plant. And it is thriving. So these are just the little things that you can think about to be better stewards of the environment and up-level your consciousness with water. So JP, you're a rock star. Thank you so much. And uh, this is the end of a beautiful conversation around water consciousness and the effects of structured water. Thanks again, everyone, for participating. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, everyone. Thank Thanks. you, Alana. Thank you, everyone, to your team. Blessings. Water is life. Aho, everybody. Aho. Cheers.